everybody. This is Tracy Malone from NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. Today, I've got a very special guest, Erin Riley, who has written a book called The Dark Force. How appropriate is that when we hear about narcissistic stories? The, the, when I was reading Erin's book, the similarities between our stories were overwhelming. I mean, there's always similarities, but I couldn't stop writing. Oh my God, that happened to you. Oh my God. Oh my God. It, it was It was just synchronous how exactly the same our stories were. And so I brought her here for us to, to learn and hear because if they were so similar to her and I, I'll bet they were similar to you as well. And it's about us being validated and understanding that we're not alone, we're not crazy. And these narcissists, male or female, um, are kind of cut from the same cloth. So let's go visit with Erin and see how our stories overlapped. We had a great conversation. We talked for an hour beforehand and we talked for an hour afterwards. I want you guys to listen and hear the stories and hear the journey of the destruction of narcissists and what they can do. So let's go meet Erin. Hi, Erin. Welcome to my show. I'm so glad that you are here with us today. I am so happy to be here. It's an honor to speak with you today. Uh, you are really, to me, at the top of the narcissistic abuse recovery you know, community, and, uh, and it's an honor to share my story and discuss it with you. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so honored. Your book, A Dark Force, um, when I read it, I was so taken. I was like, this is my life. And people tell me that all the time. Are you talking about my life? And then I'm like, I'm reading your book. I'm like, she's talking about my life. It's It just trickles around. So before we get started with some of the questions and talk about your book, I would love it if you could just give us a brief um, introduction to who you are. Okay. Well, um, my name is Erin Riley, and I am 64 years old. I live in Philadelphia, just outside of Philadelphia. I was born and raised in New York City. Uh, I had a rather unconventional childhood, kind of call myself the original latchkey kid. So we'll probably talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, I worked in the music business for 40 years. I worked in radio. I worked at record companies. I opened my own children's music school. Uh, I have uh, produced concerts and events and all kinds of things my entire life. I even gave a TED Talk. Right? So I've done a lot of cool things with my career. Uh, but unfortunately, my uh, my uh, some marriage marriages did not go quite as well. Uh, as my career life did. So my romantic life uh, became uh, unmanageable. I married twice and uh, the second time to uh, who the book is about. So uh, so that's kind of my story. I'm here to share that story. That's the most important aspect of my book and why I'm here today. Well, everything in the book is amazing. It's called The Dark Force and uh, we'll hold on up in a little while for people. As I said, when I was reading the book, I actually, I was listening to the book and I uh, was like, you know, chopping vegetables and going, oh man, I need a piece of paper. I got to write down that. That's like, that's what happened to me. Oh my God. That's what happened to me. I, and it was like a book by the time I was done of the similarities in our stories. And mm -hmm. I know that most narcissistic stories overlap, but our similarities and even location stuff and everything was just Oh my God. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Oh yeah. So I want to talk about just, again, the, the, the reason that our stories are similar is our starts off with our, our growing up and our background. And um, you said you were a scapegoat in the family, as was I. Tell me about your childhood life, because this is the vulnerable part that if we have something like this, I had an alcoholic mother and all of the other stuff too, check, check, check. And that makes us more vulnerable. So tell us about the beginning of your life and then we'll get into some of the later parts. Okay, so as I mentioned, I grew up in New York City on the Upper West Side in an apartment. I am just a mom and dad and me and my younger brother is just two years younger than me. Uh, but it felt like the Stepford family. Felt like everybody was kind of moving in their own directions. People weren't really connecting. You know, there wasn't affection or romance between my parents that I could see. It was just everybody's getting the business of the family done, like 
somebody's getting something at the grocery store and somebody's off to work and you know whatever it just seemed like there weren't those warm tender moments of you know snuggling in bed or when you're sick mommy's sitting with you or any of that you know intimacy that you see other families have uh, but as a child I didn't really know that anything was wrong with my life I really didn't know I didn't have arguments and screaming and yelling and throwing things uh, it wasn't very dramatic it was just kind of you know, like I said, sort of like the business of the day. As kids, we were left to, you know, take care of ourselves and grew to be very, very independent. Uh, my father was the alcoholic in my family dynamic and uh, and also very depressive. So my father could be the sort of charming guy at the dinner table, tell a story uh, when there was company over, but the rest of the time he might be sitting in a chair looking out the window kind of daydreaming. He's a bit of a daydreamer. He did most of his drinking away from the house, so we as children didn't see him drunk, but you could cut the air, you know, with a knife in my household, for sure. My mother was a fashion model. She was a big haute couture runway model on, you know, in the fashion district in New York City, working with all the top designers, and uh, so I would look at her and even though she seemed to be very cold and unaffectionate and unemotional, very much like one of the mannequins my mother was, um, she seemed to be the one that was getting stuff done, right? So my assumption was that she was more of a parent than my father was, right? But what I didn't really realize is that she <laughs> didn't want to be a parent and she wasn't doing parental and motherly things. You know, she was, she didn't see us, she didn't hear us, she didn't make space for us, she wasn't affectionate with us, right? So, but like I said, since she wasn't drinking and depressed in her undies, staring out the window, I thought she wasn't the problem. In writing my book, A Dark Force, I actually sort of tied it all together and realized that more of my uh, challenges uh, with emotional and re romantic relationships growing up were a result of my mother and came to learn that my mother really was very selfish, very manipulative. Um, she could lie uh, pretty quickly to get what she wanted and uh, and liked a lot of attention. Now, we all like attention, but, you know, some people like attention a little more. And when you're a mom, you know, you're usually supposed to be more selfless, right? You're supposed to put the attention more towards your children. Uh, so anyway, that's maybe how I grew up uh, craving attention because I didn't really get attention as a child because my mom was getting it. And then growing uh -huh. up. Were you, so, so I crave the same attention that you're talking about, same family dynamic, just reverse the alcoholic part, um, an emotional father that just didn't talk to us or only yelled, get out, get out. I, you know, this, you know, we had our own TV rooms. Like we never had a family night watched a movie. We never, and if you dared walk into theirs, which was the library, you were not, you know, what do you want? You got three seconds, it's a commercial. You And then and it was it was so not like normal families, but I didn't know. I mean, I'd see my other friends and they all play games together and they do normal family things. And, you know, people would actually drive their kids to school when it rained and my mother wouldn't even get out of bed because she was hung over and she would leave 60 cents on the counter and we'd have to walk literally you know we did have shoes but we'd have to walk a mile to school and it was just like she just didn't care you know mom it's snowing there's 12 feet of snow wouldn't wake up wouldn't care and so when you have someone that just doesn't value you you end up thinking that's normal that's right. Yeah. Oh, just hit the nail on the head. Absolutely. Absolutely. I became tall. I could learn to tolerate being stonewalled. That was the biggest thing in my marriage is that I would ask my husband a question and he would take 30 seconds to a minute to never to respond. And I would just go, oh, well, you know, you can't make a person answer you. So, oh, well, it's not like I felt like I didn't deserve an answer, but I thought I can't force them. So, you know, same thing, just move along. You're not getting an answer. Just accept it. Just accept everything, accept every bad behavior, accept everything you can't change. You know, life isn't fair. Shrug, shrug, you know, just to me, <laughs> ghosting was our family vacation. Like, 
never since we actually all left the house at, at 18, which we were never allowed back in from from that point of of all of us being out there, we were never um, a cohesive family and we just didn't do anything together. And, you know, I thought that ghosting like both of my sisters never talked to each other. I was the only one. I thought I was the glue. I'm the glue that I'm the only one that talks to everyone and and. So when I had a man that would ghost me, it was normal. It's like, oh, don't be I bad. You can fix it. Let me just fix this. Maybe I can do something that'll change that outcome, right? I'm watching you talk and, and we're both doing this. And I wonder also if that's another similarity that we have and whether that brings attention. I know at least for myself, um, I feel like maybe that's why people notice me is because I, I move a lot when I speak and I use my hands. I don't want to make you feel self-conscious. I actually love it. It's really expressive and it's fun to watch, you know, when people are talking and they're animated and whatnot. I don't want to be a dead person. That's a narcissist. They're all dead. I don't want that. No, so. absolutely not. And, and and if we go back to negative attention, um, how did you get negative attention when you were growing up? Um, did you, were you a good student? Because I went the opposite way of my my honorable sisters to get attention. I was the bad one, and I was failing gym and doing things just to piss them off to get that attention. Did that have any experience in your life? She's laughing. Oh no, I was the best. I was such a good girl. Oh no, you're making me laugh because I think we're sisters and maybe your sisters are some other weird people or something. Oh, don't even get me going. I would like mouth off at the teachers. I would get up and walk out of class in the middle of a class, drinking, smoking pot. I shoplifting, you know, drove my car at a hundred miles an hour with open beer in the car, with kids in the car, ran a stop sign. I just, I didn't, hmm anything. I didn't think I would live to the age of 30. And I didn't even, I wasn't even upset by it. I was like, oh, we're just going to have a fun time on this ride. Because I just figured something had to happen. I don't know. There was just something was going to go wrong and it never did. And here I am. So I'm very lucky to have survived myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I say the same thing. I was actually with some high school friends yesterday and we were all having conversations about how bad we were like if my son was half as bad as I would I don't know what I would have done right it's 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 amazing how much we did that should have killed us um yeah. just drunk driving again they didn't have safety belts I'm not talking like we're talking we're older they didn't have safety belts there was no DUI like it was it was just a different world back then and um you know just the the things that we did that were again was I did I was I doing it for attention I was starved for attention. And so when it came into my, my romantic relationship, I didn't have the skills to know what a real relationship looked like. I didn't know how to set boundaries. I didn't know how to, to, to navigate the waters of a healthy person. And so I know that I had to do that work because I, you know, messed up a bunch of times, but it, it is, it is very, very common for um, victims of this kind of abuse with the family of origin to either be the golden or the scapegoat. And so we obviously both elected to be the scapegoat and get yep. that negative attention, even if it was just for that. So let's talk about um, what- I just want to jump in for one second and tell you that I called myself, even as a teenager, the divining rod. Whoa. You know what that is? That's a little thing you put on top of the roof that attracts lightning. <laughs> I was the family divining rod. Bring it at me. I'm strong. I can take it. But really what I wanted was that attention that I wasn't getting. Wow. So I yeah. have a license plate for my Camaro Raleigh Sport that said wild one. Talk right. about arrest me. Like I didn't have that happen, but I was a ticket driving down the street. <laughs> <laughs> was it red? <laughs> It was, it had a big stripe. It was green, but it had this big stripe across. It was, you know, one of those fancy ones and it was a stupid thing. But again, attention seeking, did just someone please validate me. Please love me. I was searching for love in all the wrong places because I didn't know what love was. So it was as quick as the intermittent stuff I got from my parents and my family was all the people that ended up being in my life in those early years. So and boundaries too, right? We're looking for somebody to set a boundary, somebody to say, Tracy, you're grounded, right? 
And that means I love you. I don't want anything to happen to you. I want you to stay safe. You need to learn to, you know, control yourself so nothing happens to you because I love you, my little girl, right? But if they don't, you're like, well, how far do I have to go to get somebody to say, oh no, I don't want anything to happen to you. I love you, right? Never. <laughs> I never heard it, did you? <laughs> Oh, I never heard uh, proud of you, all that career stuff I told you about, not once. And I want to say my mom was about 87 years old the first time she told me that I was attractive or pretty once. So she about 87, she was pretty close to gone, and she was laying in a ball in her nursing home. And I think I came and sat down, the light was behind me, I had a good hair day, and she goes, you really are pretty. It's the first time I ever heard it. I was like 60 years old. I'm like, thanks, mom. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. So so she's the model. She's the pretty one. Oh, of course. She's the pretty one. Oh, wow. That is so yeah. scary um, to even think about that, that she was that way. But again, we didn't even talk about this. This is, has nothing to do with the book, but we're just talking about the overlap. And, and I think a lot of people are going to go, oh my God, that was my life too. Mm -hmm. My mother was cared in Connecticut at a nursing home by my other sister. And um, I moved her here to Colorado. And when we're doing the intake to the doctor, the doctor's taking stuff down and, and the doctor said, you're so lucky to have a daughter that's, you know, going to be there and help you and everything. And she goes, you know, what's really weird is I never thought it would be Tracy because I always liked her the least. And the doctor just stopped, dropped <laughs> his head and went, excuse me, ma'am? You can't make that up. I was like, this is what I'm used to. This is normalized. Here I am, moved you across on a $20,000 medical jet to get you here to take care of you every day until you die. And she admits, you, yeah, I never thought it'd be you. I, I liked you the least. I'm like, thank you so much. May I have another lump? But that's what we get accustomed to. And that's how it ties mm -hmm. into being with a narcissist, right? If we have these kind of experiences, it it's, makes us vulnerable to someone else. Like you said, with the, the you know, the passive aggressive behaviors and the not answering you and things like that. When it's normal, it's normal, and and we don't even know it. Neither one of us knew we were with narcissists until they both were over, and we were able to do some research. And they can smell us coming, right? They know exactly where the little weak spots and holes in us are, and that's what they go for. They fill up those little holes in you. They give you that attention, make you feel seen, all the things you're looking for. They can just detect you know, people that have that need for, you know, being cared for, loved or whatever are vulnerable to them. And, uh, and they go in for the kill. And uh, they're so, uh, uh, I guess one of my biggest things I try to educate people about, about narcissism is it's all intentional. And that's something that I think it's really hard to unpack and really believe is that all of their actions are transactional and intentional, right? And, uh, and that's just really hard to recover from when you have to kind of like uh, revisit your entire life with the narcissist, right? And go, so the, from the day they meet you, they're looking for the holes in you. They're looking for the tolerance level that you will exhibit, you know, to their bad behaviors. They're testing you. And then when they figure, okay, schmuck, they're in. You know, they go in there, they make sure they wrap you all up so you can't get away. It really is just like a spider. You know, they inject you with a little bit of poison and then they start wrapping you up and then they eat you for lunch. Absolutely. Look, I have a new mug, my favorite new mug, poison. Wow. And how very October of you. That's right. What I it's a special mm -hmm. mug for October. But, um, you know, what, what you're talking about too is that when they're looking for supply, what value do you have? Besides the weaknesses that you described, right. right? Not seeing it. I remember my last narc, who was not my husband, but he, he, I came over his house one day and he was crying, which I thought was so sensitive, but he was hmm. crying at the computer screen that his ex-wife had called him a narcissist. And he was just like, am I a narcissist, honey? No, I'm so good. I love my children. And I didn't know what it was. And I was like, oh no, honey, you're not a narcissist. Holy crap. Was I surprised that that was a test. Does she know what it is? And I passed the test. I didn't know. So therefore I was good supply. And again, supply means what do you have that 
you can offer them, right? So everybody has different things, servitude. So, you know, how could, will you be that good wife, have that nice little baby, take care of the house and, uh, and do all my bidding and take care of me for just a couple compliments and kindness once in a while, right? That's what we got with crumbs. And this is the servitude part of, they had a reason you were all of the good things about you and all of the bad things they could abuse either one of them. Yep, all of it. They're just taking inventory and studying you that they call that the, the um, what is that? It's not the mirroring. The mirroring is when they act like you when they're, uh, I forget, I forget some of those terms and whatnot. But, uh, but yeah, they're just looking for those places that they can get in and just go fill your empty spaces and needs and whatnot so that they can get what they want. You know, um, since I was older, I was 40 when I met my narcissist, Fabio, uh, not his name, by the way, surprise. Um, <laughs> I own my house outright and I already had a huge career going on, right? Had a lot of friends. So he took one look at me. He had been kicked out by his first wife and living in a rented apartment. And uh, so he looked at me and thought, hmm, house, money, job, you know, friends. So I had a lot to bring to the table for him. And, uh, and so he set about on his work to, you know, to just make sure he was bringing flowers and jewelry and, you know, uh, romantic, as I, we talked about earlier, The Princess Bride was our favorite movie. He was constantly quoting little love quotes from The Princess Bride to me. Uh, he built me a kitchen and all the bathrooms. And he just like, he took care of everything. And it's like, this is the first time in my life I ever felt cared for. He took care of, you know, the money. He would do the grocery shopping. He would do the driving. He would plan the vacations. Oh, this is just wonderful. I feel like a princess. Well, in the end, he had control of everything. He had control of my phone. He had control of all of the credit cards. He had control of all the bank accounts. He had control of all of the TV channels and the passwords. He had control of everything, right? And so when he decided to pull the rug and take off with it, uh, I had nothing. Literally, I didn't have a phone. I didn't have an easy pass. I didn't have a Costco account. I a TV doesn't, nothing. It's just crazy. Again, you can't make this shit up, right? No. <laughs> the, I the wanted him to take care of me. That's why. It was, it was, listen, I don't want to say it's my fault, but it was my vulnerability. It's what I wanted was to feel cared for. So that's what he honed in on. He gave it to you. You asked. Yes, he, did. he gave me exactly what I needed. Somebody to love me that believes me and hears me and does all these wonderful things. Uh, you mentioned Princess. My ex and his entire family called him Prince Charming. And I was now the princess. They threw away all of my clothes when I first met them and said, princess is dressed like this. And they took me out to Barney's and crazy stores and bought me Prada shoes that are still in a closet worn once. I never would wear that kind of stuff. It's not me. But they, they tried to change me from the beginning and I didn't see it. I was like, oh my God. He's like, this is how families that love you are. They take care of you and let's go buy you $5,000 in clothes today. And I was just like, oh, I, I don't deserve that. I don't need that. I'm fine, you know? But it was, this is how princesses get used to it. This is how we are. And I was like, okay, well, I didn't know the real family, but this seems a little on the other side of it. But it, it all fed into the charm mm -hmm. and fed into the hook. And as you said, and I have said before, we were looking for a family. Yeah. The most that we wanted was someone that would be there, be, do all those things and be a part of a give and take situation. But in the end, it really wasn't give and take, was it? Not even at all. And, you know, neither of us knew what a family looked like or felt like, you know, mm -hmm. it's not just four or five people living under one roof. That is not a family at all, you know, but at least for me, I felt like when I would go over and visit my friends, it's not like I saw a lot of family scenes, right? Because I'm playing there with my friend. So maybe dad was at work or mom was in the kitchen or maybe she was at work or some other thing. You know, I might see some interaction that was a little more affectionate from a mother to a child than I would receive myself. Um, and I might feel a little twinge of jealousy, just a little like, oh, that was kind of, hmm, I wish I had that. Uh, but like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, 
I wasn't aware that there was a problem. I really just didn't know how other families acted or how relationships were. Uh, I didn't see my parents being affectionate with each other. But then again, it wasn't like everywhere I went, I'd go to my friend's house and the parents are making out in the corner, right? I didn't see that. But the kids did, right? My friends probably did catch mom and dad kissing in the corner, pinching each other, like hugging each other at the stove, right? They probably did when they were in family time. Uh, so I just didn't know, you know, I just didn't know. Uh, but I know now. Yeah, exactly. I, know. I got it. How was this? Because this, as you were talking, I wrote it down. The family dynamic was also for us and, and my family was very wealthy. We had a giant yacht. We lived in big houses on the water. We had a good life. But for gifts, I would beg. I remember getting a little teeny tiny heart that was $30 for like a, a gift for my like maybe sweet 16 or something and I just wanted something because everyone else was getting beautiful things and they'd come in after Christmas and they'd have their new outfits and I got new underwear and I was just like very confused by the fact that we had all this stuff and they could do right. all these amazing things but at the same time that's our money, not yours. You don't even, you know, I started working at 13 to be able to buy a second pair of pants for the whole school season, right? So it was very, very confusing. Did you have the same thing with your family where they were generous with you or they just like, you're on your own, go get a job? Definitely you're on your own. The only difference is, is my parents didn't have money. So both of my parents there, were, there was no money. We were in a rent-controlled apartment in the Upper West Side before the Upper West Side was the Upper West Side, right? I went to public school. You know, we had a wood panel station wagon just because my dad did business trips and whatnot. Um, but same feeling about the presents and the withholding and all that stuff. So we didn't get presents. I never, my I would thought about this. My father never took me out to like lunch or took me shopping or bought me a dress or and same thing you're talking about. I started working at, I think, 10 years old in New York City. I had a dog walking service and I got paid for that. And then my first real job was at an ice cream shop and I was 14 at that time. But the reason why I got the job at the ice cream shop is because I wanted a new corduroy gray wardrobe for school that year. I was like, gray was the color, like a heather gray. And I wanted some corduroy and some sweaters. And my mom said, your clothes are perfectly fine. So I wanted this style for this summer to be the hip in style or whatever I was seeing in a magazine. And, uh, and she's like, you don't need that. But I come from a long line of martyrs, you know, immigrant martyrs who are like, you know, just, <laughs> you don't need anything. You're lucky to be here, right? You're just, you're lucky we feed you. Exactly. <laughs> Our lives are just so overlapping. My first job was at Friendly's scooping ice cream. So oh, um, we really are sisters or are or, or just like twins. Um, so when you fell in love with Fabio, let's go right to that. What was it about him besides that he started doing things? What was the hook? What, for me, it was the charm and the kindness and the, the generosity. What was it for Fabio and you? Um, I'm going to say something that I always feel really guilty even thinking. It's hard for me to actually say this. I feel guilty saying it, but I never loved Fabio. I never loved him. Why? She says, why did you never love him? I always felt some distance some secretiveness, some uh, something that was being withheld from me. So I didn't, I couldn't connect with him because he didn't speak very much. So Fabio, not charming, not a bit, not like your classic overt narcissist, very quiet. Um, he would sort of stand around with his arms folded at a party and just kind of agree with people, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, or seemingly agree with people. While I was probably going, you're an idiot. You got nothing smart to say. I don't know why I'm wasting my time here, but it does look good for, you know, to my wife that I'm pretending to talk to you. Oh, good. Now I can escape. Right. So that's what he's probably really thinking. But as he's going, people are thinking, what a nice guy. Doesn't even take up any space in the room. He's not all full of himself. 
you know, not like that Aaron girl. <laughs> She's all talking and throwing herself around and needs all this attention, right? She needs all this attention. And he's he's good for her. He's good for her. He'll he'll weight her down a little bit. Her he'll bring her down into some like, you know, reality or whatnot. If I make my own dinner, right? I'm doing everything for myself. Then I moved out to California when I was 19 and I'm still alone trying to break into a career, et cetera, et cetera. Then I moved back to Philadelphia for my career and I'm again living alone until I'm 31 years old, right? And then I met my first husband who, uh, he knows the narcissistic tricks, but I wouldn't call him a narcissist. He loves babies. He has real empathy. You know, I've seen him cry and actually take some accountability for things occasionally. Uh, but he certainly knows how to triangulate, blame, shift, and, you know, maneuver when he wants to. But I wouldn't call him any kind of full-blown narcissist. Um, so I left my first husband when I was 36, had another four years alone. So I think that was it. This guy came along. He's going to fix all the broken things in my house. He's going to renovate my kitchen for me. He's going to pick up some groceries on his way over to like watch TV with me at night. And I thought, boy, this is so nice to have help. He's going to pick me up from the airport, right? How many times when you're single do you have to like get some kind of a way home from the airport? Feels good to have somebody waiting for you. So for me, it was that. He wasn't charming per se. He wasn't gushing with his, but he was reliable. You know, he would show up for dates. He would show up with flowers, right? You know, he just, uh, like I said, he was, uh, a he seemed like a rock. He seemed like a rock to me. And I thought, this is what I need. I actually need a rock to tether myself because I'm so crazy. I'm, I'm going to float away like a balloon. Right. So if I could only get some rock here to tether me, then I would probably be, you know, a little less. I hate to use the word crazy because that's their word. <laughs> but uh, but you know what I mean? Like just sort of uh, untethered. That's it. Untethered. I always felt like I was just on on the verge of going over a cliff sometimes. Does that make sense? You know, absolutely. <laughs> And, and I know you had said something in the book about him being a crazy driver. And that related to me too, because narcissists are famous for, they own the road, get out of my way. They're rude. They're horrible. Mine drove so crazy that I would hold on to the handle like every single time. And he would be pissed at me. And I'm like, literally, I'm going like this in the car on the handle. And he's like, well, I'm from New York. You just, you're just not used to a New York driver. I'm like, well, we live in Colorado now. You don't need to drive like that. Like, it was just an excuse after excuse. I felt unsafe and he didn't give a shit. No, not at all. Mine had uh, vision issues and dizziness. He had like a vertigo thing. So imagine getting behind, you know, in a car with uh, somebody like that behind the wheel. He would be on the steering wheel like this. Oh, creepy. Because he couldn't vision, you know, he couldn't see. And he also was a tailgater. Yeah. So he, and another thing he would do, drove all of us crazy. You know, my son from my first marriage as well too, is he would drive full speed into a stop sign or a light and then hit the brakes really hard. So everybody in the car goes, whoa, like this, whoa, right? You can see the light is turning. It turns yellow first, right? <laughs> I mean, that is mostly the way. So, uh, so yeah, you can see the, the light turning and, or if you're approaching a light, you might want to take your foot off the accelerator just so you don't have to hit the brakes hard. But no matter how many times we mentioned that, it got worse every time. Absolutely. Because yeah. we were asking for something and therefore, you know, if we didn't want it, they would have given it to us on a silver platter. But if we say, you know, that bothers me, this is what happens. We're setting a boundary. That makes me feel unsafe. Could you please just pay better attention to that yellow light, right? There's a color in there. Maybe it was colorblind, right? Go for the position then, sir. You know, like we were just looking for them to step into what our needs were. But as adult children of narcissists, we were used to not being heard. So we were like, okay, just, I guess I got to accept this because right. hold on and that will be my car ride every time I'm in the car. And then it would tell people that I'm a terrible driver. I'm like, I never had an accident. I've never, I mean, I get a couple speeding tickets like every 10 years, but I, I, I'm a really good driver and he would just smash his car and not even care. He would be like, oh, well, I'm like, which is my car? Well, 
Like it didn't matter. Nothing mattered. To him. The other guy's fault. Well, it's his fault. So the blame shifting. Yeah, exactly. I should have seen all of those things, right? So let's get back. We've talked about how this happened to us, our backgrounds, our similarities and stories, and even mm -hmm. in history of repeating patterns and looking for love. Um, and just sort of some of the things that they do that were so familiar. Your book was like literally, here's my life. <laughs> um, but during the um divorce, yours hid money and did some other terrible things. Do you want to just give us a quick like what happened during the divorce uh, <laughs> no <laughs> I'm laughing because when I read when I did the audiobook and I voiced and narrated the audiobook I was fine until I got toward the end and had to relive all that stuff again and I I literally fell to the ground while I was speaking on the microphone multiple times had to leave I'll come back next week. I can't do it. It was so painful. Uh, so I didn't know I was getting divorced until he told me after he filed. Had no idea. You know why? Because he kept saying, I love you. I'll never divorce you. You're going to have to divorce me. I will never file. Right? Of course, he had a $5,000 lawyer on retainer already. And because I really good at telling myself whatever I want to believe, you know, my cognitive dissonance skills are top notch. I saw that $5,000 charge on the credit card and I mentioned it to him. I said, why do you, why'd you retain a lawyer? And he goes, oh, that's just in case you divorce me. And he goes, and if I don't need it, then she can redo the wills. Wow. And I believed it because I don't lie. I don't lie. So I think people aren't lying to me, especially not my husband of 20 years. Any, maybe a stranger, but my husband wouldn't lie to me. Well, that's just foolish, you know, and uh, and that's something I also talk about a lot when I'm talking to people about narcissism is the first thing you have to accept is uh, they're out there. They're out there. There are people that are out there that do not have your best in uh, best intent, you know, don't have their best intentions towards you right from the get go. Right. They're out there and they want to get something from you or get over on you or trick you or whatever from the get go. And you just have to accept the fact that they're out there and they don't think like you do and learn to recognize the words they say, the things they do, because like you said, it's a textbook. It's a textbook. There are some slight variations. They say the same words. They say the same phrases. They do the same things. So once you learn those things, you can recognize them. And the other thing I tell people always, trust your gut. That's something that somebody like you and I, people like you and I have been taught not to trust your gut. You don't see what you're seeing. That's not your mom drunk in bed. You know, that's not happening. That's not happening. Just move along. Just don't look. And you go, okay, you know, and you just get trained and conditioned to do that. It's part of your survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's crazy. It's absolutely <laughs> textbook textbook and and i swear we're married to the same guy um, <laughs> maybe we were i have to let me just jump in and tell you that i did have and it's in the book uh fabio's first wife of 13 years so that's a total of 33 years of this guy she and i got to compare notes so i'm one of the lucky ones in that i was validated by another person in a relationship with my husband who said same 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 and he called her not just crazy he called her psycho with a B, that word. I'm not going to say it on your show, but he constantly in front of the daughter. So uh, she's not at all. And if she's if she was a little crazed, we all know how she got there. Exactly, exactly. And, and on that one, the similarities were not with the ex-husband, but with the next narcissist. Um, I became best friends with the girl he was sleeping with and we went to Italy together on our bucket list trip <laughs> and we've made, my idol. We, we made videos together. She stayed with me for a month, two times. Um, and we became, oh, that's great. Sisters. Like, and, and it is so, it's so funny. But then when I was writing my book, I get a call from a woman who says, is this Tracy Malone? And I'm like, hello, you know, what do you want? I don't think they're selling me something. And she's like, I've been dating your ex-husband and I think you just saved my life. Oh my God, how wonderful. Her story of how his family was gaslighting her is in my book. So again, she invited me to her next wedding when she 
dated someone else we stayed friends for a while then she then she was marrying him she's like i want you to come and i'm like i think that's weird but um but at the same time like the similarities of everything that we've gone through you and i talked about something that was extremely cruel and i know we could sit here all day and talk about the horrible things they did to us but the pictures of your life mm -hmm. my pictures of, of 10 years were completely destroyed tell us about the pictures in your life that he did well, you know, as I was mentioning, uh, Fabio controlled everything, and I thought that's what I always wanted. I always wanted somebody to take care of things like, oh, I don't have to pay the bills and balance the checkbook and do all the grocery shopping and, you know, hire a plumber and hire an electrician or whatever to get things fixed around the house. I have somebody to help me with that. Uh, so he also took care of all of the pictures from, you know, the wedding, the vacations, the whatever we did around the house. You wouldn't find a lot of pictures of Fabio and I in the same picture together. You wouldn't find a lot of that. And let me just tell you, like, I, when I said I feel guilty about it, he didn't feel good to me. He was not kind to me. You know, in the beginning, yes, I'm all over him, like, you know, but by the time we moved in together, uh, he just, it's like that negative energy. You could feel it. Right. I don't think I knew what I was dealing with at all at the time. But now that's all I ever try to pay attention to, you know, is how do I feel? And that's what I also tell people. Stop yourself. Ask yourself, how does Tracy feel here? Right. How do I feel about this? I don't like the way this feels. And then act accordingly in your own best interest. Right. And that's not like a narcissist does not in a calculated, premeditated type of way. I mean, as life is happening slow down and check in with how you feel about things so and I, I didn't I didn't get too into it I just want to step back for a second and let you know that Fabio stole my $100,000 prenup and tried to gaslight me about it and told me that I had ripped it up in front of him and that maybe I had a brain tumor he lied about pension stuff he probably had lots of secret bank accounts Accounts all over the place. He stole a $300,000 retirement home that we built in Panama on an island overlooking the Caribbean. Now you ask, how did he do that? How do you steal a home? Well, let me tell you, in case you ever feel like doing that. No, I'm only kidding. In Panama, a person who is an expat cannot buy property. You can start a cor corporation and the corporation can buy the property. So Fabio's father was a federal judge which meant that Fabio was very well-versed in legal issues and he would just take care of everything for me. So he took care of everything legal in Spanish that I don't speak. And I thought, isn't he wonderful? He's taking care of buying me a beautiful, beautiful jungle property overlooking the Caribbean where I will live out my years doing yoga and growing my own vegetables. And, oh, I just can't wait. I'm going to have the best life, right? Well, he gave himself a majority interest in the property so he could just pull it out from under me at any time he wanted to. And we built this house together for eight years with a builder traveling to and from Panama. The whole time, I know nothing. I'm probably standing there with him while he's telling the builder that, I'm not moving there. You know, he's probably telling the builder in Spanish, like, wait till you see what I got going on. You know, who knows? I'll never know. Um, but I came to learn that he had done this right from the get-go. And it was our Panamanian lawyer that eventually told me, she's a woman. She was like, did you know he did this? I said, no. She goes, should have said something. I just thought maybe you guys had a deal. So yeah, talk about calculated, premeditated, transactional. 20 years later, still the same person. So they cannot change. They cannot change. They can fool you for a while. The good news is that we can. And yes. <laughs> heal all of those childhood wounds. We can, you know, learn to set better boundaries. We can learn how a bad person makes us feel. Because until I learned all this, I, I would feel terrible. And I would just be like, why? Why is he so mean? Instead of like being forceful and going, that's not okay. I just took so much and I know you did as well, but victims mm -hmm. who have been through this, who are relating to any of our little ha ha funny stories, yeah. these are true things. And you and I both know that most victims in some form have these types of things, cookie stamped. I even have, you ready? A rubber stamp. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I thought that made me a nice person, right? 
I know? thought I was being a nice person, right? By being a schmuck. And you know, there's, I've, I've learned so much and, and I obviously you have to, and I wish I didn't have to learn it the way that I did learn it. It would have been nice to have learned these things from parents, whether it be by example or whether it be by actual lessons, you know, teaching you, this is, you know, how you should handle a situation like this. You know, there are some parents that actually do it. Um, but I also think of our generation. I start my book with all those phrases that we were told as kids, you know, I'll give you something to cry about. Don't do as I do. Do as I say, you know, shut up. You know, I, children should be heard. Seen and not heard. <laughs> yeah, seen and not heard, you know, clean your plate. Like what are all those things? Just dismissive stuff that, you know, maybe their parents said it to them and their parents said it to them as well. But I feel like it created a lot of damage to people because it, it took away your sense of self, your sense of being. You suddenly realize, or I felt like, I had no choice. I had no rules. I had no, you know, I had no, I had rules. I had no agency. I had no valued opinion, right? Nothing about me has value until I turn 18, right? Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. So I just am waiting until I'm 18 so I can make a decision or, you know, as I put it in my book, have a fluffernutter sandwich, which I wasn't allowed to have either, <laughs> uh, do the things that I wanted to do, right? Um, but I wasn't even mad about it because I just thought, oh, well, I'm a kid, no rights. Oh, well, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, but I carried over into the marriage too. You know, it just carries along with you until you learn those hard lessons. Absolutely. And again, the, the, the cost of the lessons is far too high for most survivors and whether they get financially ruined or, you know, just everything stolen from you, your home, your retirement, your life they've been conning the entire time. So if people can start to realize the red flags earlier and not be there for 10 or 20 years, you know, this is what we have to educate the world. And your book is a perfect thing for people to read. Do you want to hold it up so people can see what it looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm very proud of it. It's called A Dark Force, 20 Years with a Covert Narcissist. And, uh, and I get a lot of attention for the fact that I did put the word covert narcissist in it, because that is a little bit of a buzzword these days. People have a kind of a curiosity about, well, what would a covert narcissist be? You know, because we all have seen overt narcissists, you know, in politics, in, you know, movie stars, uh, even on TV depicted, like maybe a Don Draper of Mad Men or Tony Soprano, who would just kill anybody, you know, for pop or whatever, with no empathy and no remorse or whatnot. So we see people like that, but those people are braggarts and they're walking around, you know, and they're like the head of the advertising agency or whatever they are, they're rich or whatever. Uh, well, there's a whole nother variety uh, out there that my husband, I would call, he was like Eeyore, hardly talked, very socially, <laughs> socially awkward, just kind of quiet and seemingly dutiful and, you know, uncomfortable and wasn't really good at sports. I have to say he was kind of a mid-level everything. You know, he had a lot of talents and whatnot, but I wouldn't say he really excelled at anything. You know, he was sort of a mid-level manager at work and he would say, oh, that's to take the focus off me because, you know, when you get up there in the higher echelons of management, those are the people that get cut, you know, this way I can kind of stay under the radar here. You know, you just want to believe everything they say because you tell the truth, you figure that's what they're saying. Well, there's probably a whole lot of other reasons why, you know. Um, but anyway, I came to learn that everything was, uh, everything was a lie, everything. And, uh, and that's a lot to sort of undo. You start going over uh, experiences that you had with a narcissist and you go, oh, so when he said this, what he really meant was this, right? And uh, I'm going to bring up one of the narcissist uh, gurus because this is how I wrote my book. And her name, as you probably know, are Dr. Romani, right? So I'm going to say Dr. Romani. She suggested writing what she calls an ick list. She said, write down every icky thing they ever said or did to you, things that made you feel icky, so that in the aftermath, you don't glorify them and remember the good parts or the, what, the fake good parts or whatever, the false self that they present, you know, because it's almost ironclad. Then you can go back and revisit it and you can see the magnitude of really what happened to you and what you've been through. Well, that's what turned into my book. 
I sat there with my little ick list and I would cross off this story, this word, this phrase, this mean thing he said. Literally, they're almost all in here. About 98% of them was my ick list of horrible narcissistic things. Uh, and I didn't know I was going to go all the way back to my childhood. I had a couple of friends reading it a little bit in the beginning to help me out, just to kid, point me in some direction. And one of my friends said, well, first of all, you got to let us know some good stuff about this guy. Otherwise, we're going to think you're the one with the problem. Why would you stay with somebody so horrible? And secondly, what in your childhood and in his childhood happened to come together and create that toxic mess? Yeah. And I was like, okay, bingo, let's go back. Yeah. So I'm so grateful to my friends that helped me get some direction for my book because there is a cause and effect. And that's what anybody who's been through one of these horrible toxic relationships you must look inside yourself and heal yourself and love yourself so that uh, so that you are you are capable of having you know a genuine love relationship right because it all starts in here you know we can blame them point the finger at them all day and night just I just want them to go away right go away <laughs> be gone be gone we don't be gone get your own planet people see ya exactly well this has been such a pleasure thank you so much erin uh i'll put a link down below how can people um find you i know we'll put a link down to the book as well because i really think that if people read it they will see these these truths in their own life as well so how can they find you thank you i i hear from people every week a couple people every week from all over the world that say oh my god same as you like same 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 uh so you can find me everywhere i'm everywhere i'm on facebook I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. I have a website for the book, which is adarkforce.com. You can purchase autographed copies uh, on my website. And also, hold on, you'll get a kick out of this. Hold, hold please. I also sell, you know, just in case anybody needs one, <laughs> I'll send you one. I figure everybody needs just one voodoo doll, you know, just for fun. You know what? And Here's the weird thing. When my husband moved out and I was packing up all of the shit in the house, I found this little box that was unopened. It was a voodoo doll kit. It had a doll, had like pins, had a book on how to do it. And I I poke it. I've obviously named it him. And I poke it every while with 15 needles, like in and out, sewing the needles through him. And then I throw it somewhere like hidden and it's there for like a, a year. And then I'll like be dusting and go... Oh, it's in the sewing box. There you go. And, uh, <laughs> and for another year, it, it just gives me such a release. It's good. So I'm so glad you have that. That makes me laugh. Thank you. Yeah, that's the whole point. You have to have some, you know, you have to keep it light to some degree. Otherwise, you know, the just the pain of this will take you to the ground. And and I recognize that you are you and I are very fortunate in a lot of ways, in many, many ways. Some people have health issues that are paramount and prevent them from leaving. Some people, you know, have been taken out of the working world for many decades and are not able to get back into the working world. So, you know, we're both very fortunate that, you know, we have been able to regain the health issues, you know, that we suffered under the you know, the period of time that we were with a narcissist and uh, and have the ability to to work and take care of ourselves. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there for the people that are struggling, perhaps reading and educating yourself and learning some tools like gray rocking or, you know, just working on yourself so that you can keep yourself as healthy and happy as you can. So what a great way to end it. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real, and it's an honor. It really is. I don't want to embarrass you, but I've had my eye on you for a long time. You've done a lot of work to help people. And uh, thank you for doing that. There's a lot of us out here that really appreciate the help. Thank you. Wasn't she great? <laughs> I don't know if it was me or just our similarities, but we could have talked all day long and compared stories and the similarities how did your narcissist measure up to this? And did you have the family connection that made you more vulnerable to a narcissist? These are the questions and the pieces, the links that I wanted to tie together in sharing her story, my story. I, I thought it was important because I hear this every single day from people. And so if you could start to identify that you are not alone, 
that's what this video is for. You're not alone and you're going to be okay. So in the end, we're both shining and happy. And we wrote books and that is sweet justice. So have a great day. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do. My name is Tracy Malone. I coach people from all over the world. See the map behind me? All the pins from all the people all over. I stopped putting them up because there's no room on the map to stick all the little pins in, but I can help you. So reach out. My information is down below and I'll see you guys soon.